So a biomechanical analysis is what one of the major tasks or one of the major kind of benefits of doing biomechanics as a unit, especially as a coach. If you were doing the full unit, you'd actually have this as your major assessment. It's a big one. When we do a biomechanical analysis, we analyze, we kind of break down a movement or a skill into parts and examine how to improve those parts based on two different types of analysis. And the three areas we really look at here are the ones we've examined. So why bother? Four main reasons. Motor development is important. Uh, when we're talking about motor development, remembering from all the way back in the very first lecture, development is the natural kind of accumulation of skill. So we're talking about from doing nothing to crawling, from crawling to walking, from walking to running. This natural development of skill is what we call development. When we get into motor skill development, then we get a bit more specific. So motor development itself, expected motor skill, we kind of can manipulate with coaching techniques. We analyze to improve performance. So if I have an elite athlete, there's only so much they know about their sport. There's a position for a coach to come in and be the expert in that area. Think about it, what's the role of a coach? If the person there is the expert, then why do we need to be there? We must have something that they don't or something that they need. The ability to analyze their performance is very, very valuable. That's where it comes in here. Understanding injury, we're spending a whole week on injury next week. Understanding how uh, a certain training method or a certain technique can lead to an injury, and an injury can be anything from a bad training session, a week off training, to just destruction of a career. If you make one mistake, or if you kind of built up a mistake over time and didn't see it coming, this might help you out in that area. And this one goes hand in hand. If we know where the injury is coming from, or the reason it's being caused, we should be able to prevent it. So top two kind of go hand in hand, and the bottom two go hand in hand. Who does this? Five main groups of people, just summarised here, and we're going to go through them. Why do coaches conduct analysis? Why would you bother? Improve performances. In general, yeah, that's, that's what you're there for, isn't it? If you didn't have a coach, what would we expect? Not as good performance. The coach is there to improve the athlete's performance. Teacher. Think about high school setting. What, why would a teacher bother uh, kind of conducting a biomechanical analysis? So the teachers come out to PE and they've shown up and there's a kid that can't throw. They're in year eight and they can't throw at all. Why would a teacher be interested in this type of system? They're trying to develop the skill. They're trying to develop that kid in the skill of throwing. Maybe that if they've never experienced this before and the teacher didn't have the ability to analyze, might not be an in-depth ability, but if they had no ability, they'd just look at the kid and go, yeah, they wouldn't even know if they're good or not. The ability to say whether that kid is good at throwing or not is very basic biomechanical analysis. And the next level of that would be, actually, I can tell they're not that good. The next level is, how am I going to improve them? So it might be very, very shallow. It might be your English teacher who's just sitting on the side, watching sport and going, I can tell that kid can't throw. Then the next level teacher would go, I can tell they can't throw because of this. And then the expert would be able to improve them. Athletes, if they're aware of this, they don't need to have that in-depth knowledge, but we've got people coming through here, elite athletes that are studying these units, and they walk out of it at the end going, you know what, I've gained knowledge about how my body works, I feel like I can improve performance from that. 
So not only is it good to have the coach there on the side to tell them what to do, but sometimes it's actually good to have that little bit of knowledge yourself when you're the one performing. Biomechanist. This is the person that comes in with all the high-speed cameras, the timing lights, all the expensive, fancy equipment for the particular analysis. This is the money. They come in, whoever's got more money gets the best biomechanist and the best kind of equipment. The reason we have these biomechanists is to take it to the next level. Think about if you didn't have a camera and you could just use your eyes. Okay, the person with the camera can just review. Now, think about upgrading that camera. My camera's twice as good as yours. I can slow down this, this motion twice as good as you can. I can see twice as much as you can. And it just gets better and better and better. So the more equipment you have, and usually the more money you have, the better one of these you're going to get. And finally, doesn't come up as much, but think about this, health practitioners, there's been an injury in the general population. Or someone is recovering from anything, or maybe they have had a disease, they've lost their memory, they don't know how to walk, something's gone wrong. Health practitioners need to be able to analyse someone's movement to be able to diagnose and repair. So these five groups of people all have a different reason for doing biomechanical analysis. We are mostly sitting in the coach and athlete section. When we do a biomechanical analysis, we can go down two paths. We're going to look at both of them, and our tute is dedicated to one of these in particular, with a little bit of a taste to the other. Quantitative is the first path. We've seen this word before. We should definitely be remembering it from our assignments. Quantitative refers to quantity, in other words, numbers. When I'm doing a quantitative analysis, I'm measuring exactly what is going on. It's not me guessing what's going on, it's me measuring what is going on. So there's minimal argument when it comes to a quantitative analysis because it is what it is. How fast was he going? He was going this fast. Do you disagree? Oh, well, here's the data. That's where it stops. There might be different methods for gathering that data, where there's a little bit of grey, but in the end, we've got some solid numbers to discuss what we should expect to see and what the actual result is. On the other hand, we have qualitative. Qualitative assessment is the more accessible form. It is subjective. In other words, we view some sort of skill or movement and make a judgment call. This is the example of a gymnastics judge. They are looking at the movement and making their own personal analysis. Yes, it is based on criteria, but in the end, there's no solid measurement. Coach, uh, judge number one could say, yeah, it's definitely a 9.5. Coach number two goes, that's a 9.3. Who's right? You could just argue all day, and they will. That's why we've got this variation when we have a judging system. So the one on the left, the quantitative, is numbers, it's measured, it is what it is. The one on the right is quality, subjective, based on personal assessment. Both of them have their advantage. Let's talk about quantitative first. Let's talk about the numbers. As I said, actual measurement. Problem with this is it's usually equipment. Pretty much has to be equipment. You're measuring something, whether it's the time of a, an event, whether it's the angle of an arm moving that we've put a video into a computer and went, that's the actual angle, we've measured this angle. All these things are measurements and they're usually expensive measurements. Think about how we upgrade someone's speed, like upgrade the knowledge we have. You could start off with a stopwatch, a dollar. And then you get the timing lights, $10,000. And how much does that actually help you? Milliseconds. Milliseconds, $10,000 for a couple of milliseconds. This is where we're at. Biomechanics gets very expensive, but if you want that cutting edge, if you want that extra couple of milliseconds, you want timing lights. Maybe it's not the way we really want to do it. Invasive sometimes. Think about uh, an athlete going on their normal sprint, they're doing a 100 metre sprint, and now we say, actually, 
instead of running in your lane, could you just run on this platform I've designed? It's a bit wobbly. Uh, you probably might fall off, but just give it a go. This isn't very effective. It's not very realistic. So is it really worth doing if it's not an accurate representation of what's going on in their sport? It will give us some values and they'll be solid, but do they really line up? So if it's not really that accurate at times, if we don't set it up the correct way, why do we bother? Three kind of sub reasons here. If you're an elite athlete and we need to improve you for those few milliseconds, then yeah. Yeah, we're going to need to find ways to actually measure your performance so we can improve you. Maybe it's something like we're doing a general population and we're just looking at work, ergonomics. In other words, ergonomics refers to uh, the way you sit when you're at your desk. If you're going to sit at that desk for eight hours a day, that's 40 hours a week, times 40 by the amount of weeks you're working in the year, and then have that job for like 20, 30 years, that's the, like the majority of your life you're spending at that desk. We better know the right way to sit at that desk. This is kind of the boring side, but very important still. We don't really get into that, but still a huge area here, the workplace. All these need to be justified with numbers. It can't be, I reckon you should sit like this, because I reckon that's the way. We need more. We need some actual definitive information to say, if you sit in this position, in other words, knee angle is this, ankle angle is this, hip angle is this. In 10 years, you're likely to get this disease. We need something like that to back up any information that we want to give to the general population. And it, it's, it's more specific. If you could choose between qualitative and quantitative, if you wanted the specific one to give the most information, the very direct and kind of inarguable pieces of information, you'd go quantitative. If you want to have a subjective discussion based on technique, you'd need to go qualitative. Still on quantitative analysis, there's two places we can do it. We could do it in the lab or we could do it in the field. Let's say we do it in the lab. That's great for a lot of reasons. That's what we do here. It's what we do across the road from ACP at the Institute of Sport. We can control the room. We can control the environment. So when we're doing training studies, we can say, all these people that trained in this room, the room was 26 degrees, it had 80% humidity, they trained for exactly this long because we timed them and we watched them. We have video footage to prove that this is how long they went for. We can measure everything. The bike will give us the information about every single pedal that they do. We can control everything in a lab, but it's not real. So we might have someone that can perform amazingly in a laboratory, put them in a race and they come dead last. And maybe it's the other way around. Maybe in the race environment, they're a freak. You put them in the lab and they've been in the lab. They've been training outside for 20 years. Put them in the lab, they, they look terrible. It's like they've never played the sport before. It's a completely different environment. So the advantage of the lab is that we can control everything. The disadvantage is it's not real. It's a constructed environment. The field, it's the opposite. It's real environment, but sometimes we need to make kind of judgment calls on, is, is this the right thing? Imagine doing uh, research in the field, uh, meaning outside the lab. So when I say in the field, that could be uh, on a court. Let's say I'm doing netball. Uh, Mike has done a lot of studies in netball. She's the uh, unit coordinator in this. She was in the mid-semester exam. You would have saw her there. A lot of research on netball and positional demands about players and how much like the centre in a netball court will run and how hard they'll run in a whole game versus like a defender or a shooter or a wing. Now, the problem with that in the infield, outside the lab example, is maybe we look at their performance in one game and they've just dominated the competition. They've dominated that game versus a game where they got smashed. Though that data, the amount of running that the, the positions would have done would have been completely different and it's just because of the nature of the game and we can't control that. So if we want control, we do it in the lab. If we want realistic, we do it in the field. We need to find that kind of natural balance or 
understand whichever one we choose, we need to accommodate for the problems with each one. <coughs> Let's look at qualitative. This is the other side of the coin. Qualitative analysis is subjective. You view a skill, a movement, a technique, and you make a judgment call on whether that technique is the best. You might look at a skill and go, I think that's amazing. And the person next to you, who's got exactly the same amount of skill, or the same amount of experience, I should say, in that sport, completely disagrees with you. Who's had this experience where you've gone, you've got a friend or you've got a coach, someone that's with you, and you've looked at something and went, that's great, and they've gone, that's crap. Who's had this ever? Yeah, it's, it's really common all the other way around, yeah? It's, it's gonna happen all day, every day, because it's subjective. And in the end, argue for hours, not get anywhere. Agree to disagree. Sometimes that is the case. However, qualitative analysis has huge advantages. Don't underestimate its power just because we don't have a definite answer. When you view a movement, you can see all these things. How fast the limb's going, the angles that that limb's going through, the speed the whole body's going. Like if you look at someone going for a run, from that side of the room to this side, and I go, you're not allowed to use a stopwatch or any type of technology, you can just watch them. And at the end of it, I went, did that person run fast or slow? You could give me an answer. If I went, how is that person's technique? You could give me an answer. You could, could, could provide me with a massive amount of information that could provide uh, enough for me to make an analysis on this person, whether they can run or not. Just because you don't have numbers doesn't mean that you can't really add value to an analysis of a person and technique. And usually, 90% of the time, when you're out in the field, you're doing this type. When you're watching performance and not using any technology, you don't have any numbers involved, you're using qualitative analysis. There's a problem. When, whenever we do have a subjective value, it's gonna go either way. We have these limitations. You could be right, you could be wrong. Is it worthwhile then even having a discussion? Yeah. Because you might not be spot on, but you can eliminate some things. There'll be certain things you can agree on. So you'll notice in those conflicts, coach to coach or player to player, when you're having these qualitative discussions, you might find some common ground. You might say, well, I think that his elbow is going as fast as it needs to go. And my other person goes, I think it's going too slow. That's the problem, we disagree. However, I say, how about the shoulder? Is the shoulder going through at the right speed? I think it is, and I'll go, yep, I think it is as well. So you can at least eliminate the things that you disagree on and agree on, and say, okay, let's focus, let's actually find the answer, and that's where you might go combination. Qualitative assessment to begin, to work out where your agreements and disagreements are, and then say, well, now it's time to get some numbers involved. We know the shoulder's fine, but we've got a big disagreement on the elbow. Let's do some analysis on the elbow. Let's get some numbers involved. This is how a combination works extremely well, and it's usually how it's done. What are the main goals of qualitative analysis? Simply to describe. If I'm not giving you numbers, then I must be giving you just a general description, like a verbal description. This is good, this is bad, needs to go faster, needs to go slower. Nothing concrete, just general description of the skill. This is where the problem concept comes up. We're trying to work out why this person isn't performing as well as we expect them to, or how can we make this person better? The way we do this is starting with qualitative. Work out what the problem is and then go tackle it. What we're saying here is the way to work out what the problem is, is by your judgment. As a coach, you should be able to at least look at the movement and at least target a general area of where it's going wrong. Is it the setup? Is it the actual kick? Is it the follow through? You should be able to get a general idea of where the problem is and then follow up with quantitative 
to find out exactly what that problem is. And in the end, it's just to improve performance. This whole reason for any type of analysis, qualitative or quantitative, is to improve performance. Whether it's in the sporting field, we're talking athletes, elite athletes, or just general motor development, motor skills, we're trying to improve. What do you need to be able to be considered an effective qualitative source? Two basic things, really. You need to understand what's going on. In general, if you had no idea what the goals of the sport are, what the goals of the skill are, then you would have no idea what feedback to give. You'd look at it and go, that looks really weird. And they don't know what they're doing. I'm like, how do you know? You don't even know what they're meant to be doing. So how could you tell me they're doing the wrong thing? So first, you need to know what is expected. Before you can make a judgment call, you need to know the goals. And secondly, once you know what's going wrong, you need to be able to identify the specific area where it's going wrong. The component of the skill where you think the error is occurring. The more experience you have, the easier this would be. This is the difference between an elite level coach that's been doing it for 50 years versus you just starting up. Elite level coach shows up, watches one training session and goes, here's a list of problems, let's target these, fix it up. Someone else watches a two hour session and goes, yeah, pretty good. Like, oh, that were good. Could you give me some feedback? Yeah, that guy's a bit slow. Whereas an elite level coach, they're just watching every single thing and they're just doing like an analysis of every player. They just look at them, okay, move on, next player, look at them, okay, next one, look at them, and go through one by one by one. Look at individuals, look at the team performance, make a judgment call, move on. So experience in that field, in the particular sport, will make you a better qualitative analyzer. Let's do an example of a general uh, qualitative analysis. Let's look at the tennis forehand. Who's, who plays tennis in here? One, yeah, two, three, okay. Let's see what we can do with the forehand. First thing we wanna do, what is the purpose of a tennis forehand? In other words, what is the goal? What do we got? What's the actual goal? I agree with that, get the ball over the net. Where does the ball need to go? I think you said it. Yeah, land, land within the court, yeah? Like, within the lines. So we've got over the net, within the lines. That's the purpose. Any other critical purpose, or is that it? Win a point, I'll take that. The goal, the end goal of a tennis forehand, it must go in the court, must go over the net, the goal is to win a point. That is our purpose. That's number one. If we don't know the purpose, we can't go any further. So we've established a good purpose. What biomechanical principles can we discuss in regards to the tennis forehand? In other words, we've done four weeks of biomechanics now. Give me some concepts that I need to think about when I'm instructing this tennis forehand. What did we do last week? Fluid. We talked about fluid mechanics. We talked about fluid motion. We're talking tennis forehand, which means what's gonna happen? Top spin, tell me when we're talking about top spin, what biomechanical principle would we need to understand? Drag, if we have top spin, Magnus. Magnus, okay, Magnus force. Tell me the ball is gonna be a projectile, what three things affect a projectile at point of release? Three things. Yeah, velocity, force. So it'll come up when we're talking about drag, it is a biomechanical principle. 
Three things. Projectile. Velocity. Angle. And the difference between me hitting it here and me hitting it here. Point of... Point of release. Point of contact. Three things. This is how we start to break down a skill. We start talking about biomechanical principles. What's some specific teaching points that you would give for someone doing a tennis forehand? Like, you're the coach. This person hasn't struck a tennis ball before. What do you need to tell them? I can't hear you. Grip the tennis racket. Correct, I'll take that. What do they need to do in relation to the ball? Do they just, like, ball's coming from here? Instruct me. I need to do what? I need to look at the ball, face the ball. So I've got to grip the racket, face the ball, tell me about my swing. Do I start like here and just do this? Start behind, strike the ball, follow through. These are examples of critical elements to do with the skill. So notice what we've done. Number one, we had established a purpose. Our goal is to get the ball, critically, to get the ball in the court. In the court. Then we say, what biomechanical principles do we need to understand to be able to improve this technique? We need to understand Magnus Force. We need to understand that the ball is going to be a projectile. We should be understanding the force of the racket coming in. The force of the ball coming in. The mass of the ball, we're using a tennis ball. Maybe we need to understand the difference between striking a ball with a certain mass and one with a lower mass or a higher mass. Everything we've discussed in regards to biomechanical principles can sit in that number two section. Number three, we've gone critical elements. Instructions, in other words. Grip the racket, face the ball, watch the ball as it comes in, racket back, strike the ball, follow through. All this has been done, and then we determine where the error occurs. The person that strikes this ball is not going to get it perfect. Now, our job is to analyse this movement. We don't need to provide feedback on the spot. That could be very detrimental. Maybe we don't want to tell them, that was crap, go again. Just, just let it be. But your job is to be able to analyse what did happen. So when you watch, you should be able to see where the error occurs. So they've, they've done everything right up till now, gripped the racket, watched the ball, they've started here and they've done this. So you should be able to at least tell they didn't start back where they're meant to, we need to improve that section eventually. Then you provide feedback. And a discussion on feedback and when to give it is quite important, which is why we're going to talk about it now. Two types of feedback. We have task intrinsic feedback and what we call augmented feedback. Task intrinsic feedback is what you receive from your senses. So you can see things, hear things, taste, touch, smell, proprioceptive. All these things is task intrinsic feedback. It's the feedback you give to yourself. What we're more concerned about is the one on the right, augmented feedback. Augmented feedback means that you couldn't have done it without assistance of some sort. That assistance is anything that assists you. It is usually the coach. But I will tell you, augmented feedback could be adding a mirror. So notice you're still using your eyes, but you couldn't have done it by yourself. You needed the mirror to get that specific feedback. Augmented feedback means, the, the word augmented means to change, to manipulate the feedback that you've already got. So it looks like this. When we discuss feedback, we've split it already. And we know that on the left hand side, that's your senses. Visual, touch, auditory, proprioceptive. proprioceptive. I haven't got smell or taste in there. They would count, but as you know, we're rarely using them 
in a sporting context. But everything that your senses produce, left-hand side. Right-hand side looks like this. We know there's augmented feedback, but there are two types. What we call knowledge of results and knowledge of performance. Have we heard these terms before? So yes, second years have, first years, no, okay. Good concept to understand. Uh, quite basic, but important. Let's look at knowledge of results. Simply put, if I, as a coach, provide feedback to you that gives you information about what happened, the end result, the outcome, that is me giving you knowledge of results. We call it KR for short, KR feedback. So if I say to you this, you did your exam, KR would be, you got 60. It's what happened. If you did a golf swing and it went in, KR would be, it went in. It is simply the outcome. It is the end result, it is what happened. Kick a ball, misses the goal, I'd say, you missed the goal. It's what happened, it's the outcome, real simple. The other side is this. Title should be knowledge of performance, KP. Knowledge of performance is the actual skill. It is a description of your skill. For example, KP for a golf swing would be bend your elbows more. Extend your elbow. Your body position was too far forward. Something to do with analyzing the person's technique. So notice the difference here is quite clear. Knowledge of results is what happened. It is an end result. It's like a summary. Knowledge of performance is analyzing what they did. So your arm was this, your leg was that, your body was in this position. Uh, I need to see your leg pull a bit more when you're, doing, when you're cycling and you're gonna grip the ground. I need you to grip a bit more. These kind of descriptive terms, usually qualitative terms, are on the right hand side or knowledge of results side. So tell me this, we have a golfer and I say, your shot went into the rough, KP or KR? KR, because I'm saying, here's what happened. Knowledge of results, here's what happened. Rehab patient, I tell them, you walk 10 meters further today, KR or KP? Is it an end result? Is it a summary? If it is a summary, an outcome, it must be KR. I get a sprinter to watch their technique in a video. KP, it's about technique, it's about what you're doing. It's not a summary, I'm going, look at this. KP, I tell a gymnast their scores. KR, good, we're getting it. I tell a cyclist, uh, can you improve your pedaling technique? KP, and hard one, hard one, don't, don't underestimate this. I've got a rehab patient that's connected up to a, uh, a machine that sends electrical signal to say when a muscle's activated. And when that muscle is activated, a buzzer goes off. So think about this. Am I giving a summary of what's going on? Or am I looking at an element of their technique? Summary, an outcome, or it's continuously happening? What do we got? I'm hearing KP. It's a hard one. It's not a summary of what happened because this, think about what's going on here. The buzzer could be going buzz, 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 buzz. It's just telling me that that element of their movement, that piece of their technique is occurring. It's not an end result. It's not a summary. If I said to you, during this session, the buzzer went off 37 times, that would be KR because that would be an end result an outcome, a full summary. Give this a go, one minute, if you've got paper and pen, give it a go in, in your group between you, write a KP and a KR for these situations.
Real quick, one minute job. If, the, if you're there, someone's got paper, sit around, do it as a group task. KP, KR for these. One minute, go for it, go for it. Get in there, if you don't have paper, sit around someone. Thirty seconds. Okay, just a quick one there. Let's go, we'll go left, right, and we'll do one for each. So, someone give me a KR for a golfer hitting a drive. Go. I heard got it in the hole, I'll take that. Anyone else? Hit the fairway, yep. Everyone agree? Good, easy. Tell me, rehab patient, learning to walk, give me a KP. KP, knowledge of performance, person's learning to walk. He's walking across here. I need you to work on your balance. Yep, that's performance based. Focus on lifting your knee higher. Good. Yep, kind of wobbling around. I want you to focus on the way you're distributing your weight. Good. Let's go, let's go gymnastics and let's go one for one. Give me a KP. Now give me a KR for a gymnastics routine. You scored a 98. Give me a KP for a gymnastics routine. Bend your knees. Poor technique. Point your toes. All these are correct. The concept between KP and KR, when we want to use knowledge of results, outcome-based, summary-based, when we're using knowledge of performance, which is KP, it is performance analysis. Which one of these do you think matches up with qualitative feedback? or qualitative analysis. So if I'm going to do qualitative analysis, which one of these will I use mostly? KP. If I'm going to do quantitative with numbers, which one is it usually going to be? KR. These don't always match up. There are exceptions and there's ways that you can kind of mix and match. But in general, uh, knowledge of performance, is usually connected with uh, qualitative. We're just going to look at two basic questions and then wrap up with one last section. When should we provide feedback? Before we do a performance? After we do a performance? During? Well, you can't provide feedback before. That would just be demonstration. So it must be after or during. And then the other question is, how often should we provide feedback? Should we do it all the time? Should we never give feedback? Or is it somewhere in between? 
If we give feedback after, it's called terminal feedback. Terminal coming from the word terminate at the end. So when we give terminal feedback, we're saying your performance is already done, now I'm going to give you some feedback. And it looks like this. There's two terms which we're going to see. There's this KR delay interval and a post-KR interval. Don't get too in-depth with these. What I want you to see is this picture in your mind looking like this. If I get someone to practice something, let's say a uh, baseball strike, they finish, I'm going to give them some feedback and they're going to do it again. That's what that looks like. Hit it once, I give them feedback and they do it again. Yep. The KR delay is this. Between when they finish and when I speak to them. So how long is that? And the post KR is once I've given them feedback, how long until they go and do it again? Turns out for the one on the left hand side, the KR delay, if you do this in animal studies, we've tested the length of this, for an animal, for like a dog for example, they want this delay to be near non-existent. Like think about training a dog, all right, you know, yep, come over here, yeah, good boy, whatever, here's a treat, straight away, here's a treat as quickly as you can to confirm that that was the right behavior. So the feedback, yep, good, here you go. That's not the case in human studies. We like to think about what we've done. So you go, you strike the ball, and you just completely missed it. Studies show that this section, before you speak to them as a coach, you should give them a bit of time to let them think about, oh, I wonder, maybe, maybe, maybe I should have done this. Maybe I should have done that. Give them some time. It's the opposite to an animal. Animal, like a dog, straight away. We want time to think about it. When you give that feedback in this middle section, whatever it is, then we need to consider, once I've given the feedback to my player, do I tell them to go again straight away? Like, uh, make sure you bend your elbow more. Go. Or do I give them a period of time? It's again a period of time. We're not locking it down on how long we think it is, but we know it should be there. What we should be aware of as coaches is the KR delay is for them to think about what they've done. Oh, I stuffed that one up. I really need to hit it a bit higher. And then you tell them what you think as the coach. And then the KR or the post KR is I've given you some feedback. Think about that feedback and see if you can put it into your kind of process. Like I've, as a coach, said, bend your elbow more. If I've given that feedback, it's beneficial for the player to have a bit of time to walk over and go, okay, coach said bend the elbow a bit more, so that means when I'm going to go back here, I need to line this up. Give them that time to actually put that in their mental process. If you don't, then it might not even come through. Like that. It's like you, you never said anything. So being aware that there's these two intervals is key. Concurrent feedback is during the performance. So we just said what happens after. This is during. So this would be the person is doing the skill and I'm talking to them as they're doing it. Two sides of the coin here, there's positives and negatives. The negative would be something like this. They're getting ready, they're ready to hit the ball and I'm standing next to them go, yeah, elbow, 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 shoulder, 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 hit it, hit it, hit it, hit it. Like, oh. That's not helpful at all. That's very annoying. Don't do that. Like, that's not helpful in one bit. I'm getting a new coach. That's the negative side. The positive side is when you actually need that guidance during the skill. This happens a lot in physio, a lot in rehab situations. Think about that person that's attempting to walk from one side of the room to the other, and you didn't give them any feedback during. Let's say it takes them 10 minutes to walk that room because they're just in the beginning stages of rehab. Imagine you just watched them for 10 minutes and went, it's 10 minutes, you don't say anything, they're just struggling to get across the room and you're just standing there. Not very effective. In this case, the movement is slow. It gives you time to be able to provide feedback and they can kind of do a process as they're walking like, 
okay, he said, for the next step, I kind of got to focus on that weight distribution. Okay, I can do that, nice. Okay, now I'm gonna take the next step. And you've got time. So in this case, the positive is when there's time, you can give feedback during. And when there's not, you probably shouldn't. Terminal feedback is at the end. Concurrent feedback is during. And when we're talking about the end one, the terminal feedback, there's those two periods that are key, the intervals. So understanding those is important. Final section, we'll do 10 minutes on this one, and then the whole shoot is this. So the goal of the tutorial is we're going to improve our technique. So we're gonna go out there, we're gonna have one skill that we're all doing, and we're going to do biomechanical analysis, full process, and improve our person's technique. Everyone will improve in one way or another. So it's gonna look like this. Every time you do a qualitative analysis, because that is our focus of the day, we're moving away from quantitative, we're thinking qualitative. So the subjective, the judgment, the one that we should all be able to do, we're gonna really refine this skill. There's four steps. Description, observation, evaluation, and instruction. These four, we line up, one by one, tick them off, and at the end of this cycle, we should see improvement. Description is us describing the ultimate goal, the end goal, how we would want to see that skill in perfection. What do we want that skill to look like, a gold standard? Observation is us watching them and understanding the best way to watch. Evaluation is our analysis component. When we look at the performance and we are able to examine which sections we need to improve. And the instruction is our feedback. When we have the athlete and we need to tell them, here's the gold standard. So I'm thinking as a coach, here's the gold standard. Now I'm gonna watch my athlete. And now I know where their problems are. The final component is the communication between you and the athlete to improve them. Now, as a process, it can be summarized as doughies or doughy. Now I remember it as that. So seeing the whole chute is on doughy, at the end of the day, don't forget a step because we're talking about doughies. As if you weren't thinking that when, when I said doughy, you weren't thinking that picture like in your head straight away. That's what I think of. So you've got a window into my mind. Let's talk about describing our ultimate model. Like what is the ultimate way to do the skill? What's our best case scenario? For us to understand what it is, we need a knowledge of what is required. The most important piece of knowledge by far are the rules, by far because the rules determine what we can and can't do. And when we have those rigid guidelines, we're locked in place, we can't kind of manipulate those rules. So we must establish them, and then after that, we look at the two other components, what technique we can use, and what equipment we can use. For example, what would be the point of getting the razor suit for swimming, and getting all my athletes, I have a whole squad of swimmers, and I go, everyone's getting a razor suit, because they're the best all right, we're going to train in them for six months. No worries, you can't compete. Like, that's just stupid. So first, accept the rules and then make a judgment on what is my optimum technique, what is my optimum equipment. Finally, the purpose of the skill. When we looked at Federer and his top spin, his forehand, we said, what's his purpose of this skill? Get the ball in the court. Yes, it must go over the net. Yes, it must attempt to score a point, but the ultimate end goal, the purpose of this, is ball in court. Because you could get real specific. You could go, well, does it really need to go over the net? Because I've seen them hit it around the net. Does it really need to score a point? Or is it an attempt to score a point the next time? But it must go in and go in that zone in the court. When we're describing the technique, we need to understand the biomechanical principles. It's why we've lined this up after four weeks of biomechanics, to start our discussion on a more in-depth understanding of a skill. 
Think about the high jump. It got mentioned once in the shoot about the angle of takeoff. What's the optimum angle in degrees for peak height? Peak height. Peak height, peak height, peak height, peak height. 90, 90, 90, 90 degrees. Peak height. All I want's height. I'd go 90. If I wanted height and range, I'd go 45. Peak height, 9 degrees. If this is the case, then why don't I instruct my high jumpers to jump at 90 degrees, so straight up? Because they need to get over the bar. This step is in combination of two things. It's me understanding the biomechanics and me understanding common sense. If I say to you, you've got to get over the bar, however, jump at 90 degrees, this is impossible. If you had a perfect biomechanist with no common knowledge, no common sense, they'd just instruct the person 90 degrees. It's not going to work. In reality, I was um, speaking to a couple of high jumpers week before last and saying, what angle is it that you're actually going off? I didn't get a chance to speak to a coach, but I was speaking to them. And they're like, oh, it's definitely not straight. There's no, definitely not straight up. From what I gather, it's more like a 75 degrees. So knock off about 15 degrees just so they can get that run up and go over. <sighs> they manipulate their center of gravity by moving their arms and legs. Me, as a biomechanist, in that position as a coach, would need to be able to say, I need to manipulate your center of gravity. Can you pull your arms up, move your legs in this position? I need to understand that they're a projectile, and a projectile is affected by three things. Velocity, or speed, angle of release, and height of release. In high jump, I can't manipulate the height of release because they're all jumping off the ground. So it's only two things. I can only manipulate the speed that they can get in and the angle that they take off at. I can't manipulate the height. Everyone's taking off the ground. In general, we're going to develop a theoretical model. We need to understand the best way to produce this technique. And we're going to spend a lot of time on the tute developing this model for the skill that we're doing. Visual observation links in with the next step. So I'm going to talk about the two in one go. Who should observe and how should we observe? Let's look at this. Long jump. Person's running. They're going to jump. Where do I stand and why? There's no right answer. It depends what you're looking for. Notice this. I could stand at the beginning and watch their run. I could watch the takeoff. I could watch their landing. I could manipulate where this person is standing, how close or how far. Why don't I just stand all the way back and watch all three things? It depends what I want to see. So look at it in this way. If I'm close up, I get a specific. If I'm far away, I get a general. Depending on the nature of the skill is where I would stand. For example, I probably wouldn't get much from looking down above at a person doing this type of skill. Like if I had a camera above them and they were going for the uh, long jump, I might get some information from it. I might also get information standing front on and watching them come towards me. I might. But if we only have one option, if we have one choice, we need to determine which is best. Where would I get the most information from? Because you can't be in two places at once. The only way to do different types of observation is using a video. So you could have 10 video cameras set up, you could watch it all. We're going to talk about that in the tute. Why you would stand there versus there is going to be a discussion point. What are we looking for? All these elements of the skill that we lined up at the very beginning. When we said what is the gold standard of the skill, that is what we wish to observe. So if we think that the skill requires an elbow angle to be this, a speed to be fast or speed to be slow, what we're observing is everything that we lined up before we even started. So when I go to watch someone, I don't just pick stuff on the fly. I've got a list of things. I need to see this, 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 this. And I might notice more, but I need to notice what I identify. 
I'm aware of the time, so we'll wrap this up pretty quick because we're doing it all in tune. Observation, I might not watch or just watch. I might need to be aware of these things. Think about the sound of a good strike. When you hit a baseball flush and you can hear it go, I don't need to watch to, to, to kind of hear. I'm not even looking at what they're doing. I can hear that he struck that well. Certain sounds in sports can indicate whether it was a good hit. A lot of striking sports have this kicking. Kicking or striking with any type of bat, you usually get a lot from sound. Sometimes when you have someone spotting you, happens a lot in gymnastics to say, actually, see how you've kind of bent your knee in this position? I want you to extend it a bit more. And just having that person shift that angle makes you aware from that touch sense of, yep, oh yeah, I can feel that now. And the final one, your kinesthetic sense related closely to proprioception, how you feel when you're doing that technique. Evaluation is two steps. Makes sense. Number one, identify the problem. Identify the errors. We've been saying it all lecture. We need to know what is wrong. And there's certain steps to do this, actually understanding the best way to identify those errors. But the key here is, once we've identified what they are, we need to be able to fix them. The fixing is the diagnosis. When a doctor diagnoses, they, they find out what's wrong and then they diagnose. In sport, we find out what's wrong and then we diagnose some instruction. Here's what you need to do. Because without this step, you don't have a job. You need to be able to instruct the person. Your skills must be greater than them or you must have something to complement their skills to improve them. That is through instruction. Which is here. And when we instruct someone, it's usually verbally. Usually. But we can demonstrate. We can say, take a look at this. Here's what you're doing. I actually want you to do this whatever it so be, you don't need to say, you could, you could say it, you could demonstrate it, or you could show them a video. And finally, it's your job at the very end to correct the error. So your job is to correct it. You might have told them what to do, you might have told them why to do it, but your end goal, the whole reason you do this process is to fix it, is to correct the error. And that's here many techniques of how to improve this section. But if this fails, you do it again. And again, and again, and again, and again, and again. This DOI process is a biomechanic or biomechanist's life. Again, and again, and again, and again. Remember the four steps, they are key. Describe, observe, evaluate, instruct. Again and again and again. Okay, that'll be in the tube. You'll probably remember it as that. There you go.